the sermon title is rather catchy it says the doodler jesus but all that i am going to say today is what it is what does it mean to live under the law and or under the grace there are two options possible that is the theme of the story theme of the sermon today before i go further i should clarify something most of you who are using either a english standard version or a new international version may have a note in your bible king james version will not have that so as someone who has a phd in textual criticism i should I mean has worked on manuscripts it's my duty to explain what it is some of you might have noticed that from 753 john's chapter gospel chapter 7 53 to 811 they might have put it in square bracket saying that the earliest manuscripts doesn't have this passage so don't don't uh, get confused you know i'll just explain i need a little bit of time to explain that all religious texts manuscripts vary from each other before because earlier it was they did not use the printing press they were handwritten manuscripts so for example when so there are this is a reality this is a reality bible has different manuscripts and uh, all religions have that but religions have two different approaches to these manuscripts with its variations when two manuscripts vary hinduism for example simply ignores it they don't care about it they just read and enjoy whatever they received whether it differs from another or not typical example is ramayana the great epic of the hinduism the scripture of hinduism there are two broad recensions of ramayana there is something called uttara ramayana that is the ramayana story that is known in the north that is north of india and then including nepal and then there is something called southern ramayana which is famous among the south people and among southern ramayana there are still two more th- type versions of ramayana one is called the malayalam the madhya adhyatma ramayana and in tamil it is called the kambar kamba ramayana written by kambar so they don't really care whether a story differs from another story hinduism simply ignores all that islam also realized it sometime in such 656 650 the third caliph ulman ibn afan a man called Ul- ulman ibn afan he discovered that in different regions different quranic manuscripts are circulating so he ordered a project in the pro- end of the project which culminated around 656 ad he destroyed all the varying manuscripts and compiled one version and sent that one version with the command that if any manuscript differs from it that should be destroyed if you don't believe me google and you'll find it in wikipedia or anywhere else but the christians had a different understanding different way of doing it we discovered that there are many many manuscripts we also discovered that these manuscripts differ slightly none of the variations are significant significantly affect what we believe so instead of destroying them the christian scholars took advantage of that what they did is they studied all the varying manuscripts and they reconstructed the best and they also told us in the translations that you read that here is a story which is not found in the earlier manuscripts but found in majority of other manuscripts it's a very honest admission because christianity christian faith and christian scholarship are not separate i have preached many times from this pulpit about that 
we don't ignore, we don't bypass human knowledge. We try to integrate faith with scientific understanding. So that is all it is. All that is there. So, but we take a caution that nothing that affects the or has impact on Christian doctrine, Christian faith, our understanding of God and salvation will not be admitted, allowed. So this passage is a passage which actually fits in with what goes before and what comes after very logically. So I am just going to, I am just saying that you will find the same remark in Mark's Gospel chapter 16 onwards. Some, some translations will, that, will have that, some translations, but they are, all that I am trying to say is that they are integral part of the inspired scriptures. Okay? Uh, now, one more thing I want to say is that the Bible is not printed by the Pope. It is not printed by church authorities. It is an industry. Okay? So publishers publish the translation, they make their own translations and they publish it and they make money as well. Okay? And I have been part of the circus for a while as well. That because I also got money. Uh, as a writer, box writing and things like that we do and it is sold and they make money. So they are not committed to, seriously committed to faith. So don't worry about that. Anyway, Come to this story now. A very, very familiar story. There are three characters. One is one group of characters. We can say the Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes. And they caught, I don't know how, a woman in the act of adultery and brings this woman to Jesus. And what was their goal? Was chapter 8 verse 6 says very clearly they were not very zealously morally people that was not the goal they brought this as a test case to test Jesus what will he do that's all that they wanted 8 6 says this they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring ahead to accuse him Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground now, so their whole purpose was bring this woman and tell Jesus according to our law this woman should be stoned to death. Stoned to death. What do you say? If Jesus said stone her to death then she is liable for murder. If he said go, let her go then or it's not, a, I don't not say, I mean I, I, I will let her go, I will not condemn her then he is breaking the law. Jesus was in a fix. Now, the second person is suddenly the woman, very anxious. She is caught in the act of adultery, that's fine. Now she is at a point where they are going to make a verdict on her. If Jesus says, yes, follow the Mosaic law, the law of Moses by the letter, stone her, there are lots of people and there are plenty of stones around them. In that place, she will be stoned to death. So she is very, very anxious. What's going to happen? Now here is a third character. Jesus who doodles. What is doodling? Some of you may, may not be, this is this maybe not be in your registry. Uh, but it is a common word now because there is a new software that is released and in Facebook you see it a lot of time, doodler, doodling software. It's an educational tool, which I would like to try. Now, <coughs> doodling is scribbling. Scribbling something on a piece of paper or on the ground or on the trunk of a tree or on a wall while listening to somebody but by totally ignoring what they are saying. They like what you do now some of you at least. Though the scripture passage was on the screen and I am directly standing before you, some of you are buried, bury your head in your mobile and I don't know what you are doing. So it is a way of, it's a modern equivalent of doodling. 
doodling is to ignore a person let him say whatever he want to say big mouth and all sort of things you know and you do your business so what jesus did is jesus was doodling <coughs> he bent down and he was writing scribbling on the floor ground at his own pace jesus doodles twice when they brought this person caught in adultery they said to wait verse 6 they said to them said to him that they might have some charge to bring against him jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground doodling when these people brought her and said jesus look she has done something worthy of capital punishment what do you say it's a very important question and jesus just doodled he didn't care about it and then jesus doodled again the passage says when so jesus said now any one among you who doesn't have in having sinned without sin let him be the first to throw the first stone saying that again verse 8 jesus doodled now verse 8 what does verse 8 say verse 8 says and once more having said this whoever among you who has in sin without sin let him stone her to death and then once more he bent down and wrote on the ground we'll come back to this doodling business later look what i see in this passage is this we can live or humans can live their lives subjects their life to the law our laws of our religions our society and our communities or you can live under the grace of god and these two are two different ways of living these two are two different ways of living though believing in jesus christ we have moved from death to life though in jesus christ we have moved from the law to grace still we are vulnerable very much vulnerable to the law and its chastisement today i would like to focus on that this what it is to live in the grace of jesus christ completely ruptured from the hold of the law let's look at the characters one by one first of all we look at the jews i would like to look at the passage from the perspective of this woman anxious waiting for her death waiting for her painful death of being stoned she looks at the jews how does she look at the jews the pharisees and the scribes first of all they are very legalistic their eyes are focused on the prescriptions in the law especially leviticus 2010 which says if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death they have learned it by by heart they have learned it by they have learned it by heart they have memorized it and they know that next time i see an adulterous woman or a man the first thing i should do is to take a stone they know it very well many times the thinking of the society is very you need i mention it they cannot see anything else no other possibility they know the law and that law they will implement 
some for some personal reasons these days i went through a number of court verdicts case laws i had to go through many citations and one thing i realized when i was reading the person who was showing me these citations i highlighted many passages I was going through one by one of them and one thing i realized is that it was shocked to me that law has a heart many of the orders passed by the district courts and the high court and the high courts and the supreme court i realized this was something new to me even the law of the land the judges they are compassionate and kind but here are the jews they are not willing to compromise on anything anything they want to implement it right then they have a god or a conception of a god who is rigid a god who punishes everyone a god who cannot accept any sin tolerate any sin and then they also believed that their are the agents of that punishment that is whatever punishment god would like to do or bring out that we will be doing it that god will punish the sinner through our agency that is what they thought about they thought law cannot be broken they thought god is so rigid he only thinks one way god cannot think twice to different ways because of that they were absolutely ignorant of the grace that themselves received in their life because of this rigidity of their thinking because of the inflexibility of their understanding of the law they were not they were absolutely ignorant of the grace that they received every day in their life the forgiveness that brought them so far they did not look at their own lives and say look i am more or less like this adulterous woman but nobody stoned me to death i have lived all the way up to 60 or 70 they did not realize that they ignored that and why i am alive is not because i am not a sinner but god gave me the grace and he gave me the forgiveness they forgot that the irony in the passage is it says jews jesus was doodling he was writing on the ground on the floor writing on the whatever it is and he was writing with his hand with his fingers and then when he finally lifted his head there was nobody all of them had gone in which order that's very important the passage very clearly says who which order who left first the oldest left first and the younger guy did no he left because his father has left his mother has left his grandfather has left so he said okay i can go i will also go if that happens here today probably let me reconstruct it in this this way that if jesus came to this room and said and the woman is standing here and said whoever has in sin let him kill her the person who may leave maybe maybe jos chan because he is older than me then i will leave then uh, who else will leave anyway in that order we'll start leaving one by one and jeff will leave because his dad has left asri will follow because his dad and his grandfather has left that's the last guys why why it says that they retreated in the order of their age the oldest first you know why the oldest guys carry a big baggage of sin they have lived long enough to do all sorts of sin 
and that's more evident. Then the four-year-old or a five-year-old, all the sin he, sins that he has done in his life is so far getting into mommy's kitchen and stealing a cookie from the cookie jar. That's all in his account. But the oldest guys have survived so far. Escaped people stoning him. Why? Not because of his smartness. Because he has experienced more forgiveness and more grace. That is what they ignore. He has experienced or she has experienced more grace, more forgiveness every day in his life. That's a realization that Jesus brings to us. That's a tremendous realization, isn't it? That the older I get, the longer is the, or what you can say, the greater is the grace that I have enjoyed in my life. That is the greater is the forgiveness that I have enjoyed. And greater should be my forgiveness to others. Greater should be my restraint on condemning others, judging others, because I have experienced more grace, more forgiveness, more love. That's why they left one by one. In relating to people, who doesn't grow up to our expectations? Who don't meet our standards? Who fail us? I have learned one thing. That is, I should reflect on myself. I should look at on my own life. What brought me thus far? Maybe it was a gentle rebuke. Not one gentle, many rebukes many corrections, but many forgiveness, many times ignoring what I did and encouragements that I received. So, as a product of such great mercies of people and the grace of God, it takes away from me the power to condemn others, to judge others. Pray that I will have more grace to live to this standard that I preached right now. Desperately need that grace. A third thing about the Jews is their orientation to the past. Always oriented to the past. They brought a woman caught in adultery. <coughs> it may not be that night. Maybe she was known in the town, but she was dragged before Jesus to test him. Remember that. To, not to make her a better person. They have completely focused on what she did, not on what she can do. They are obsessed with the past. Now look at the past. What's the use of past? Have you ever thought about it? I know many of us live in the past. I know we most, a lot of us spend a lot of time rehashing and ruminating. Every time, you know, we think about what happened yesterday, day before yesterday, or the day before uh, that day. And then what happens is that whenever we think of the past and live in the past, we do a great disadvantage to ourselves. That is, we drain all the energy we should have for the future, for, for present, and the trust that we should have the future. We drain all that living in the past. I should have done that. 
I should no doubt have done that. I might have done it in a slightly different way. I should no doubt have uh, said that. Living in the past, <clears throat> no. There are many Pharisees and scribes who will keep condemning us, keep reminding us about our past so that we don't have energy for the present. To live in the present. To live a life pleasing God in the present moment. <clears throat> if I ask you just an experiment, for example, at right at the moment, what are you thinking about when you are or when you are when you are alone? What are you thinking about? Very few people think about the present, what they are doing. You tell you this thing? Most of us are not even aware of our breathing. Most of us are not even aware of the breathing. Most of us are not aware of our the pressure of the body on the seat we sit. We are not. You know why? Either you are thinking about the future or you are thinking about the past. Very, very few people. That is why the whole science of mindfulness, the exercise of mindfulness, which is now becoming very popular in India now, and abroad particularly, is to live in the present moment. It needs effort. It needs training to live in the present moment. It's easy to live in the past. Or it is easy to think about the future. Past is irreversible. You can't, you know, this, this is saying, you can don't cry over the spilled milk. Milk is spilled, you cannot get it back into this. Why worry about it? But, past has one use, only one use. And that use is, draw wisdom from it and throw the rest of it away. What was the painful lesson you learned from that? Did it give you a lesson? Did it teach you a lesson? Then just simply throw it away, rest of it. Keep the lesson of the past so that it will not be repeated in the future. Keep that lesson and throw the rest of the rest of the thing. Have you ever enjoyed, I'm so, with, with all apologies to those who are not, uh, sorry, to the vegetarians, you know? When you eat meat, what do you do? You have bones sometimes. If you get bones, mutton curries particularly, and then what do you do? You suck the marrow and you throw the bone away. Isn't it? That's exactly what you should do with your past. Take the lesson from it, the painful lesson, and throw the rest of it. Can you just pass me that, uh, that blue thing on the table? You know what it is? You know? Yes. How many of you ever used one of these? My God. At least four, five. Yeah. Have you seen his ancestor, the five inch floppy drive? The bigger one? I have hundreds of these. There is a lot of data on it. Now, I was cleaning, I was moving in my house. I have audio cassettes. Have you seen it? Yes. I had a lot of video cassettes. And what I did now is, when I was moving my house, 22 years of accumulation in one place. That means a lot of things. What I did is, I threw away everything. Because most of the D uh, VHS cassettes are now in DVD. I have watched it. This data was, this hundreds of floppy disks like this. The data has been copied to a hard disk when I first bought a hard disk, a computer with a hard disk. The, the early computers didn't have hard disk, believe me. So when then this becomes, the lessons are already copied. The rest can be discarded. VHS cassettes have gone up in the flames. Audio cassettes gone. Floppies are gone. Now I'm keeping just one. This is for my grandson. So that 10, 20 years from now, there will be no floppy disk in the rest of the world. And this will go for $1 million. Keep it in a safe place under lock and key. Don't, <laughs> don't run away with it. I told you the price. Now I have, I have to put it in the bank locker now. 
Tomorrow when the bank opens, I'm going to take it. That's the only floppy disk I have. I'm going to keep it there so that it will be a thing of the past. But all other things are gone. Clean up your life. That's what I'm saying. Clean up. You have done mistakes. Accept the mistake. But throw the mistake away. And the hurting memories of that, take the lesson and keep it in a golden chest so that that will never be repeated again. But the Jews, in the sense, they will not let you do that. They keep reminding you of this. They will keep reminding of this so that you will live in the past. But now what about Jesus? Now in this context, when we live in the, in the dispensation of law, which keep on condemning us, it need not be the Jewish law. It could be the rules of the society. It, it could be the failing to live up to the standard of the society or the parents. Some people could not live to the, satisfy their parents. And over many years, they have gathered, there's a deposit of guilt which makes them ineffective to perform, which discourages them, which takes all the courage from them. Why? Because they live in the past. It's now, now time, like this woman, to clean up the past. Now what does Jesus do? As I said already, Jesus doodles. Oh, you might have heard of great sermons that Jesus died on the cross. That's true. Jesus bled and died. Wonderful. I think a doodling Jesus is also as important as the Jesus who died on the cross as well. You know why? When they bring the charges, when the, when the scribes and Pharisees brought the charges against him, what did he do? Oh, if I were Jesus, I would have said, Oh, I see. With whom did he commit adultery? When? Who caught her? Do you have witnesses? And uh, could you court the law? They will say Leviticus 20 verse 10. Deuteronomy 22, 20 to 24. Jesus decided to do them. Jesus decided simply ignore. Have you ever seen that face of Jesus? I am so excited with this face of Jesus. When your accusers keep telling you, Ezekiel, you would have been the president of Nigeria if you had taken my advice and went to that school. In the third grade, you ran away so that I had to put you in another school. That is why you didn't become the president of Nigeria. But when the accusers say that, Jesus simply do this. Forget it. Nonsense. That's what Jesus does to us. You know, you don't have to. <laughs> Ezekiel never ran away from the school. I know that. He might have gone late to school. That I believe. But <laughs> I should have said that way. Ezekiel, if you are every day, if you made up to the school, if you are never tardy, if you never had a tardy in your report, then you would have been better. What I'm saying is, when people keep reminding us, they dig deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. I had a dog. His hobby was, when he was a puppy, he will, if I give a biscuit, he will not eat at the right at that moment because he may not be hungry. But he will take it, either bury it in my shoe, put it in my shoe, my shoe, no, even not my wife's shoe, my shoe, but if he's outside, he will dig a ground, he'll dig a little small hole and bury it there. You know why? He can find it again. Eats a little bit of it and buries the rest of it there. A dog. We do the same thing. We take a little bit of that old failure, smell it, and put it down to be taken again next weekend. Smell it again. But Jesus, if we were Jesus, Jesus decided what you should do, what we should do with her. 
What do you say? The law says kill her. Jesus said, don't let it. Ignore what they say. And then he said, what do you say? You know, he said, those who haven't sinned, let them sow the first stone or something like that. Then Jesus doodled. You know for why? He allowed time for self-examination. The oldest, boom, it's a flash. He couldn't find. He realized where he was last night. He left. The next one realized. Second one realized. Finally, Alex and Jeff left because all of them had left. On the Zian, maybe. What Jesus tells me today from this scripture passage is this. I should not take every accusation against me seriously. I should not take all the, if you believe all the accusations against you, you'll have no time to live. The second thing I learned about Jesus is this. He disarms the evil. These people came with an enormous power to pass judgment over this woman and to stone her and go back as righteous that we have removed a evil from our society. They had so much power in their hands. They came with that immense power that we are now going to be God's agents in eliminating an evil woman from the society. That is how they came to put to death with that immense power that the law gave them, the society gave them. Jesus took that power from them. When he said this, among you whoever hasn't yet sinned, let him be the first to throw the stone at her. What he did is, the enormous power they pretended to have, he just diffused it all. He just drained it fully by one word, one word, one sentence. He drove, he drained the entire power that they had. He disarmed them. But he empowered this woman. Now this woman comes with absolutely no power in her hand. Maybe she is even tied up, dragged before. A crowd of men, Pharisees and scribes. She came because she had lost all power, all control on her life. But now Jesus empowers her. He didn't die. He takes the power from the rulers as in Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 to 15 says. What did Jesus do? He cancelled the record of the debt that stood against that woman with its legal demands. This is set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. He took that blame from her. He took all the accusations from her. And all the demands of the law from her. And he disarmed the rulers and authorities who were against her. But, now who gets the power? She gets the power. She gets the power to live a new life. She gets a the power to have a future. Jesus told her, you go away, go away, but do not sin. But do not sin. I am giving you a new life, a new lease of life. And I am empowering you to live, to live a new life. This is what happens when we live in the dispensation of grace, ex experiencing the power of God in our lives. We are set free from everything that haunts us, everything that makes us feeble, everything that makes us ineffective, 
all the accusations of ourselves our own judgments of our life our failures our successes all that we are so far all that we are so far god sets us free from all that to have a new life before us praise be to him glory to his name amen